Welcome back to The Art of Natural Beauty, episode number nine, number nine, number nine, number nine. Okay, so I recommend you don't play that backwards. Hey guys, welcome back. So yeah, just uh, sitting here doing the initial lead-in for this episode, episode number nine, I couldn't help be reminded of the Beatles' White Album in Revolution 9, you know, the song where John Lennon records his voice over and over, number nine, number nine, and if you play that backwards, it's supposed to say, like, turn me on, dead man. And uh, sitting here recording this over and over just to get a couple of takes in the can, I'm repeating number nine, number nine, and uh, yeah, so uh, anyway, uh, this episode is going to be about uh, the movements of the view camera. And uh, you're going to notice right off the bat, sitting next to me is my trusted Ebony 4x5. And um, a little while back in 2015, I did an episode on the introduction to the view camera. And I'll put a link uh, to that here so you can check that out if you haven't seen it already. But it was one of my more popular videos. Um, I think it's got about 16,000 views at this point. And in that video, I kind of covered this camera system and large format systems in general and did a pretty comprehensive overview of the view camera. Um, however, two of you uh, pointed out that I did make a bit of mistake when I was referring to one of the movements of the camera. Two of you have caught that and said, oh, actually, that's called swing. And right you are, that is called swing. Um, you know, sometimes what happens in these recordings, uh, you're sitting here, you're, you're on a roll, you're doing really well, and, you know, things just slip out or you just, you know, make a mistake, say the wrong thing. And, uh, but I wanted to kind of correct that today and uh, just go over again some of the movements of the view camera. I'm not really going to get deeply involved like I did in the last video because if you want to see more about it, you can just go back and check that one out. But I want to kind of amend uh, my mistake and, and just quickly go over some of the movements again. But before we do that, I want to thank uh, those of you that have purchased uh, The Art of Natural Beauty, Michigan Two Peninsulas, my first uh, photographic photo coffee table book. And uh, I want to let you know that those are going to be out in the mail shortly, actually uh, getting them boxed up to send out today. So I want to thank Marshall Husted, Robert Jones, and Randy McHale for uh, making the purchase of those books. That means an awful lot to me um, to, to, that you guys uh, wanted to make that purchase. So I hope you enjoy the books and look for them. They'll be going out in the mail today. And uh, for those of you that haven't heard or don't know, I have uh, my first photo book available right now. It's uh, 24 pages and 13 of my photographs over the past four years or so taken in the Leelanau Peninsula and in the Keweenaw Peninsula of Michigan. And um, yeah, I'm really proud of this book. Um, it's my, my first attempt at a book and uh, it, it came out pretty well. So if you'd like to pick one of these up, I'll also put the link below in the description and you can check it out for yourself. But the thanks to you guys. So let's get into this. Um, the view camera. Um, this is my Ebony 4x5, as I said. Um, really, the movements are gonna be the same with an 8x10 or 11x14. Or, most view cameras are going to have the same movements available. Now, they may not have them on both the front and rear standard. They may be just limited to the front standard or the rear standard. Um, but typically, there's going to be five movements that you're going to be able to make with this camera to correct uh, for distortion or uh, focal plane uh, issues. Um, and really, if you think about the view camera, it's kind of like a large tilt shift lens is what, what it really is. It allows you for you to make those movements for compensation. And uh, it, it just has, you know, your focal plane, which is the front standard and where your lens is affixed. And then the rear standard is your, your film plane. So those two elements and the bellows really comprise of a view camera. So again, the front standard is the, the focal plane. It's where your focusing is going to be made and adjusted. And that's going to be done here on the side. You've got these little wheels that you can draw your lens and your front standard closer and further away from your rear standard. And that is what is going to determine your focus on your focal plane, which is your, your film plane here in the back or the ground glass while you're doing your composition. And then 
the rear standard is the rear of the camera, again, where you're going to be uh, composing and, and focusing on your ground glass and ultimately where you're going to put your film holder in to make your exposures. So the movements are pretty simple, but uh, again, it's, it's a very simple mechanical system, but very versatile and powerful when it comes to the, the correction that you're able to apply to your composition for, again, focal or distortion or artistic, uh, uh, artistic visions. Um, so the first one we'll talk about is Rise. And this camera, the Ebony 4x5, will allow me to apply all of these movements to both the front and the rear standard. So what Rise is, is simply taking your, your locks here and locking them, and that will allow you to raise or lower your front standard. So again, that's lower and raising of the front standard. Now those movements can also be made again to your rear standard on this camera system. And what that is generally used for is if you have a composition, say we're shooting some tall trees in a forest, or we're shooting some buildings in New York and we want to get the tops of those buildings or the tops of those trees into our frame, but we don't want to tilt our camera back up at the tops of these buildings or trees. Because if we do that, then we're changing the, the um, alignment on the film plane. So you're going to incur more distortion. So if you take a 35 millimeter or a medium format fixed, uh, fixed lens system out, and you'll notice this right away when you set up your composition in your tripod and you tilt your camera up to point your lens up at the top of a building or, or a tree, you're going to get more distortion at the bottom. So meaning that the image at the top is going to appear narrower and the image on the, the bottom of the image is going to kind of extend and distort out, kind of like a barrel effect on the bottom. So you're going to see that a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world, but with a tilt shift lens or a view camera, you're able to correct for that. So by simply moving this front standard or rear standard up into the frame, it'll allow you to get a little bit more of that top of the subject in line without causing any distortion to be inherent in that image. So that's the first movement is the rise and fall. And again, I can show you that in the back. It's the same thing. There's a little bit more movements available to you on the rear standard than there are on the front. But same thing, you would rise and fall with your rear standard and allowing for the compensation of the image to accommodate for something that's higher out of, out of uh, your view where your composition is set up or lower. So that's the first set of movements, rise and fall. And then comes swing. And this is where I kind of made a mistake last time and I was trying to describe this and I, I guess I just got hung up in it. And instead of swing, I said shift. But what swing is, is when you either take the front or the rear standard and there's a little lock here on, on the camera in the front and I'll unlock that, but swing will allow you to act, you know, swing the lens, actually swing the lens to the right and left. So to rotate really on a center access point. So again, that can be done with the front or the rear standard. And uh, what that will allow you to compensate for is if you've got an object uh, in front of you and uh, it, 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 you're correcting for horizontal distortion is what you're correcting for. So if you've got an object in front of you, say a vehicle, a car, or some large rocks, or, or maybe a wall, a rock wall, uh, the, the part of that image, if it's not uh, completely flat and perpendicular to your, to your lens plane, is going to be kind of on, a, on an angle. So it's going to kind of correct for that parallel angle that if, if this was the front of, say, a car, my left hand and my right hand is the other side of the car. These are the two front bumpers. When I'm just directly pointed at it like this, this left bumper is going to appear larger and more distorted in, in the image, right? And the, the right bumper is going to seem a little bit smaller. So it's just going to look like it's kind of got that fisheye look 
where whatever's closest to to the uh, focus plane and the film plane is going to seem to be larger. So to correct for that, to get it to actually look, you know, to have the, the correct composition and not have any distortion to it, you would swing your lens, your front or rear standard out. And now you're kind of meeting the front of that vehicle more head on. So you're, you're not going to be the, both the right and left side of that vehicle are gonna be right on the film plane as opposed to one being in front of the, the focus plane or behind the focus plane. So I guess one thing we should talk about it is, is the focal plane. And the focal plane really is, if you picture it like a big window you're looking through, everything on that window is going to be in focus. And that's the, the plane of sharpest focus. Anything behind that window is going to appear out of focus. Anything in front of that window is going to appear out of focus. Now you can correct for that obviously with aperture. Uh, the smaller aperture that you have, it's going to enlarge for a greater depth of field, right? So if you shoot at, say, 1.4, uh, you're going to have a real shallow depth of field. And you're going to, like, if you, you know, photograph somebody's face, you may focus on the eyes or the nose right here in the cheek area. And if you're at, like, f1.4, you're going to have that real shallow depth of focus. Just the eyes and the nose are going to appear in focus, and it's going to fall off, right? But if you if you stop down, you close that aperture to say F8 or F11, more of that subject is gonna appear in focus. So that's kind of drawing everything closer to that, that pane of glass, that window that you're looking through, or, or making that glass thicker. So if you do this, you're gonna change the relationship of the focal plane and the film plane. And that's going to cause for only a certain point of your image to be in sharp focus. So if you're focusing on the front of that car, on both you know the, the right and left bumpers and the front grille, that area is gonna appear in focus, but now in front of and behind it, you're going to lose focus. So what you need to do is you may need to adjust your rear standard somewhat and swing that out as well, just to help compensate and check for that focus. But you're also going to have to shoot at a much smaller aperture just to make sure you're getting focus throughout the whole image, if that's your intention. And it may not be. You may be looking for that shallow depth of field. You may be looking for a certain area of your image to be in focus. And if that's the case, you're great. It's fine. If you're shooting landscapes, generally you're going to want everything to be in focus within your image from the foreground all the way through your subject into the background. So to do that, when you make these movements, you really need to check, again, uh, your focus with, with a loop on your ground glass. Just move it all around, make sure everything's in focus, and you're going to want to stop down that lens on the front here. So we're at 5.6 is all the way open on this lens. You'd want to stop down to whatever aperture you're going to need to shoot at to make sure you get everything in focus and check again. It's going to be much darker and hard to see, but you really need to check and make sure everything's in focus the way you want it to be when you're making especially the swing movements. This one right here is going to really alter that focal plane, okay? So, so very important, but a great way to correct for distortion of horizontal lines. This is where I kind of messed up last time. Uh, last time I referred to the, the movement of swing as shift. And again, uh, swing is going to be when you take the camera and you swing it either to the right or to the left, as we just talked about. Now, Shift is a lot like rise and fall, except it is a movement along the horizontal axis of the camera. So instead of that vertical up and down rise and fall, shift is really just shifting the front or rear standard to the right and left. So that is made by doing this adjustment or by pushing it back over to the left. And again, the same movements can be applied here with the rear standard, you can also shift it to the left or shift it over to the right. So why would you want to do that? Well, it's kind of like the same thing when you're applying your rise and fall. If there's something that's just out of frame that you want to uh, include in the composition and you don't want to 
swing the camera or tilt the camera, pan the camera any more to the right or left. Um, and you're really out of space with your tripod. Say you're up against, you know, a cliff face and, you know, below you is a fall off several hundred feet down to the lake or you're up against a, a rock wall or something where you just can't move, physically move that camera more to the right or left. You can actually move your front or rear standard by just applying just a little bit of shift. So you'd shift it over to the right, just to add a little bit more of that image on the right side in, or shift it over to the left. And that right there is called shift. So that's kind of the, the thing I misquoted last time, the movement I misquoted last time. Here it is explained, all five movements, hopefully correct as I stated before. And again, if I miss something, please call me out on it. Tilt, tilt. Here we go. Keeping on track. See, this is what I'm talking about. When you're shooting a video like this, you can kind of get off track real easy. Tilt. And tilt really is the fifth and final. And what tilt is, is it's it's like uh, it's like shift is. It's like, I'm sorry, like, like swing, right? Where you're swinging the lens right and left along an axis, except that tilt actually refers to tilting the lens forward or backwards. So you would loosen up your front standard again. And then this movement here is either tilting it down or tilting it tilt up. But on the rear standard, and this is probably the better place to make this movement, on the rear standard, you're either going to tilt forward like this or tilt backward like this and then lock that into place so you're going to get a little bit better latitude of movement especially in the tilt camp from the rear standard especially on this camera so what that is it's it's the correction of vertical lines okay so it's kind of the same thing as what we were talking about with with the uh swing except it's going to be correcting for vertical lines so Again, kind of like we talked about with the rise and fall, if you if you raise the front standard or raise the rear standard, you're actually bringing the image up to get the top of those trees or the top of those buildings in the frame or lowering it down to get the, the roots or something that's connecting you know, with your ground. Um, this is sort of the same thing, except it's gonna correct for the distortion that you're gonna get. So instead of, again, tilting the camera itself, you can tilt, you can, you can um, you can tilt the uh, rear and front standard. So say you've got uh, a building again, and if you moved your camera, just pointed it up, the top of that image is going to look more like a pinhead, and again, the bottom is going to be a little bit more rounded out and distorted. So if you apply the tilt, you can actually correct that distortion and have the image that you're looking up still at the top of the building or the top of the trees, but you can bring the bottom of your composition kind of back into more of a relative shape and that it's supposed to have and, and correct for the distortion that you would get from a lens not being on the focal plane or on the film plane. You can also use that if you want to emphasize a foreground area. So if you've got, um, you know, some rocks leading out to a lake or some, some stumps or something in the foreground, uh, mud cracks, something like that. And you want to really emphasize that area, make it seem larger. Instead of getting down lower to the ground with the camera itself, where you're going to kind of minimize the distance between your foreground and your background, if you're higher up on a tripod, you're going to have more of a field of transitional field and, and see more of the transition from your foreground to your background. As you lower the camera, you're really kind of equaling things out a little bit. So you're going to see the foreground gradually going off and then the background. You're just not going to have as much depth in your photograph. But if you want to make that foreground appear that you've gotten down close to it and kind of have that wide angle lens look, you could apply the tilt. So 
either tilting the front or rear standard. And so everything's going to be upside down and backwards again when you're working with the view camera because there is not a mirror inside of this and a prism to flip it around so we can see it correctly like there are in DSLR cameras. With a, with a view camera, the light's simply coming through the lens, through the bellows, and then landing on the ground glass. So everything's upside down and backwards. So your ground is going to be here and your sky and the tops of your trees and mountains is going to be here. So if you tilt this like so, you're going to make the ground, everything on the ground objects appear to be larger because it's going to kind of move it away from the ground and everything here in the, in the uh, mountains and in the sky is going to appear a little bit smaller. So you're going to kind of create that, that look of a, a larger foreground leading off into the background that you would get with a wide angle lens, but keep everything um, from, from being distorted and keep a better perspective. And the same is said if you want to emphasize mountains or trees or clouds, if you tilt forward like this, you're making the sky and the mountains and the trees presumably larger in the image and the elements in the front, the foreground smaller. So depending on the effect you're going for, it's a very helpful movement um, to apply. And again, when you're doing these extreme tilts and shifts with the view camera, you're changing the focal plane immensely. So that le your lens, your focus plane and your film plane are no longer perpendicular like they would be with a fixed lens on a 35 millimeter system or a medium format system. So again, you're gonna have to really make sure you may have to make some slight corrections to your front standard when you're doing a tilt like this. You might have to tilt that forward a bit to help correct for the focus on that. And again, you're gonna wanna stop down once you've done your composition and check with your loop on the ground glass and look all around the frame to make sure everything's in focus at the aperture you're going to be shooting at, which again is gonna be a larger aperture like F22, F64, something like that on a, on a view camera like this. So I think we've covered everything that I wanted to talk about with the view camera and kind of make that amendment to um, my initial video that I did uh, back in 2015 about the introduction to large format camera systems. Again, you know, a lot of you guys called me out and kudos to you for doing that. Thanks for keeping on, on the game. And uh, again, if I didn't explain something correctly, please drop a comment. Let me know. Hey, man, you screwed up again. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully you'll find this helpful. But any questions that you have that I can elaborate on further, please drop a comment, you know, below. And let's keep the dialogue going uh, here on YouTube. Keep, keep this uh, community flowing and, and just, you know, have a lot of interaction. That's, that's what it's all about, really. It's just about connecting and sharing, uh, you know, thoughts and ideas and helping each other out and having fun and, and talking about photography, our passion, right? So... Um, I guess that's it. I guess that's it for today. So, uh, you know, I'm going to sign off. But as always, thank you for watching and thank you for your support. And thanks to you guys for picking up those books. It really means a lot to me. Um, and uh, until next time, enjoy the art of natural beauty. If you like the content of this channel or my large and medium format landscape photography and would like to help contribute to my endeavors, you can do so by heading over to jasonrobertjones.com forward slash patron and then clicking on the link or you can simply click on the patreon link in the banner above on this channel as always thank you for your support and enjoy the art of natural beauty